<clears throat> Hi there. Um, today's lecture is for week 10, and uh, there are a good number of supplemental readings that I also want you to do this week, but I just wanted to introduce you to um, some of the main issues that arise in the later part of the 1980s and the early 1990s when there is a clash between the National Endowment for the Arts, um, well, not directly between the NEA and anybody, but um, artists who are funded by the NEA who come to the attention of the... Um, of certain more conservative members of Congress who um, become upset with the idea that these particular artists have been funded by taxpayer money. And this controversy actually swirls around several different artists. There are two that we're going to look at, but there are more that become part of a big, um, there's a group called the NEA4, which includes the performance artist Karen Finley, that get, in, get they get, um, basically have a court case where um, they are suing the um, the government because the NEA had um, withdrawn funding from them after they became uh, or after they were under sort of political attack and uh, there's this whole battle that goes on through the court system as well as in the congressional record and in um, public um, uh, you know, in public debate over whether or not the government should fund the arts, and if so, if there should be certain controls on what kind of art gets funded. So there's this kind of interesting moment when there is a uh, great deal of political interest in what's going on in the art world, particularly because the NEA had been funding um, art projects, and then, you know, as the art world as as art was moving in certain directions, dealing with things like identity and uh, um, whatnot, this become well as you'll see, this becomes a kind of flashpoint for um, controversy. This period sometimes get no gets known as the culture wars period because there is so much political attention being paid to what is going on in the art world. We are going to look really at two figures who were center pieces in this controversy. Andres Serrano and Ma Robert Maplethorpe, two photographers. I will warn you that in this lecture there are several very explicit um, and blasphemous and uh, um, graphic images. So please, if you have a um, sensitive stomach or if you are, well, I don't know, not a sensitive stomach, but I mean if you're a, if you are in a kind of, you know, at work or whatever, I mean this is not safe for work kind of lecture. So just be prepared. You're going to see a couple of, you know, rather explicit images in this lecture. Uh, in fact, that's why these images became the subject of controversy. All right, so let's go ahead and start looking with this image by Andres Serrano. This is a 1987 photograph from a series that Serrano was doing in the later 1980s. As you can see, it is a crucifix in this very um, kind of rich and luxuriant looking um, reddish, orangish, yellowish environment. Uh, the title of this work is actually Piss Christ from 1987. It's a very large print, Cibachrome print. It is a crucifix that has been suspended, that has been placed in, it's a close-up of a crucifix that has been suspended in a jar of Andre Cibrano's urine, hence the name Piss Christ. Now, if you saw this image and you didn't know the title, it may just look like a very beautiful kind of luminous image. Of course, once you know the title and once you know the context of what this image is, um, how this image is created, that is when this became the flashpoint for a great deal of controversy. Serrano in this series, the blood, uh, blood work series that he was doing where he was using his own body fluids um, in order to, uh, or as the subject of um, photographs, and I've got several of them that I can show you here in this lecture. Um, once it became known that that's what this substance was, of course, then it became controversial. Serrano had gotten a nice NEA grant in order to pursue this series. He was an up-and-coming photographer. Um, when Senator Jesse Helms, who was a conservative senator from North Carolina, discovered this had been funded by the taxpayers, he initiated a congressional hearing on the subject of the NEA. And it was this photographer and Robert Maplethorpe that Helms brought to the, Cong to the Congress to talk about um, questions of the taxpayer, whether the taxpayer should pay for this kind of stuff, questions of obscenity and morality um, and pornography, all sort of swirled around the images that I'm showing you today. And, you know, when do you draw the line between 
art and pornography, art and blasphemy. Um, is the government obligated to pay for art even if uh, they, the pub, pa taxpaying public doesn't understand or like the art? These are all questions that arose from this culture wars controversy of the 1980s. And in Blackboard, I've got some readings for you to do, an interview with Andres Serrano and some, um, some excerpts of things that were read into the congressional record by um, some of these senators during this um, during this hearing period where different issues are being raised that I think are worth thinking about even today. Here's another example from this series that Serrano is doing. As you can see, it's a little, just a little plastic statue of the Virgin and Child um, then also submit, sub, sub, um, subsumed in a, a, a jar of urine. One of the things that Serrano said in his own defense, by the way, and let me go back here to Piss Christ, uh, one of the things that Serrano said to explain what he was doing here is, um, and, and ways that this has been talked about and interpreted, Serrano himself is Catholic, you know, and he said he feels that, you know, he's not doing, he's, he has a reverence for, or at least he claims that he has a reverence for um, Catholic symbols. Now, there are some things that you can think about when you're looking at Piss Christ. I mean, yes, on one hand, it is a crucifix in urine, but on the other hand, um, you can think about what crucifixion actually is, and if you've ever read up on it or ever learned about it, um, crucifixion is a very body fluid intense process. Um, not to gross you out or anything, but I mean, you're talking about a person sweating and bleeding, and as they lose um, control of and nerve function, um, you know, there's there is also um, excrement and urine. Uh, as the body is going through this period of suffering, it's a, a very intense and degrading process. I mean, that's why the Romans wanted to crucify Christ. And so in one way, this piss Christ is tapping into that idea of the human and physical and bodily suffering that um, goes on with crucifixion. Serrano himself said in one interview that I read, you know, what I'm doing is um, making a commentary on all the people who really defile the image of Christ. And in the 80s, um, he was pointing fingers at the televangelists who would get on TV and tell people they needed to send in money, you know, um, in, to, the, to that particular televangelist in order to um, praise God. And, he, you know, I mean, Serrano said that was a much more defiling in the, of the name of, of Christ or of the idea of God than um, anything he was doing. Uh, so there's a couple of different interpretations that I'm offering you of Piss Christ beyond the just, well, this is shocking and blasphemous, right? Um, Eke Omo, there, uh, another of his series, the Body Fluid series, and there again, it's a statue of Jesus. And I'm showing you, this is the photograph, the large-scale photograph uh, as it's mounted in a frame. This is also from the Body Fluid series. This is literally just the materials that he um, the collected, piss and blood here, um, turned into these beautiful, very richly colored, very tonally dense, uh, large-scale, abstract-looking photographs. Serrano, when he's doing this, by the way, keep in mind that this is at the height of the beginning of the AIDS epidemic when there is a lot of focus on the, the blood supply um, in America and the, the ways in which body fluids could transmit that particular um, disease. So it may be hard to recapture that mentality now 20 years later, but that's part of what's going on here and blood and body fluids as a, a, a subject for a, an artist's work had a particularly, um, you know, cutting edge kind of cur um, currency at that time blood and soil from 1987 and here again this is Serrano turning this into just beautiful abstract texture but obviously with that title you know what the material is um, so it takes on this this different meaning and I'm just going to page through a couple of these just to give you a sense of, of what his early work was looking like and here, untitled, obviously, um, this is, you know, ejaculate and trajectory. So he's telling you this is w what this actually is, right? So he did a whole series of these where he would pleasure himself and then, you know, capture the result uh, as he could on camera and turn them into these abstract compositions. This is what he was being uh, funded for by the NEA. And this is, again, where you're going to have the... Um, 
interests of the art world and some of the ideas that we've been talking about all semester that it's you know the, the artist idea that makes a work of art and things like that are going to come up against the hard reality of conservative taxpayers. Serrano also did a series of Catholic imagery. He was raised Catholic and uh, you know talked to, talks even now and as you'll see in that image shooting or in that interview shooting the Klan he talks about his um, strong strong sort of identification with the Catholic Church but here obviously he's got um, somebody dressed up to look like a cardinal and then you've got this uh, bare-breasted chain or naked woman who's <clears throat> being hung up and then obviously has been um, has been abused and whipped uh, very kind of implied sadomasochistic sexuality very sensual or sexual image um, that by perhaps by inference or implication is you know um, connecting the church and the abuse of the authority to this kind of stuff uh, Serrano is very coy about this and he would often say you know well this is really what you're reading into it that's not my intent or you know talking about the kind of religious ecstasy and flagellants and um, these are you know, people in the Middle Ages would actually, especially in plague years, they would march, and actually pilgrims would do this too, they would carry whips with them and um, flail themselves with whips as a kind of prayer and penance. You know, this was something that was encouraged by the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. So he would argue that he was kind of tapping into a long tradition of the Catholic Church, but, you know, I think you can probably take a take up an argument with Serrano on that but here I'm bringing this in to show you because I think you can see how this would be the kind of imagery that some people would take offense to um, and I just wanted to show you too that he has continued to do a provocative series in this um, series the morgue series which was done in the early 90s um, Serrano actually got permission to go into a morgue and photograph the um, bodies as they came through the morgue to do uh, and actually in this series the series is technically very very um, well executed very beautiful in some ways and it's taking this tragic and ugly part of life and turning it into something beautiful that seems to be the subject of this particular um, series by Serrano but again I think what's interesting here is that you can also see how some people would be offended by a picture like this. This is a photograph of a, a close up photograph of a child who has, as you can see, um, died after drowning, okay, developed pneumonia after, um, developed pneumonia after um, being submerged in the water. Um, and so even though without that title you really wouldn't know whether this was a you wouldn't know this was a a, a, a dead body right uh, there's a kind of tension that's created here you know beauty and tragedy um, something that's horrific to look at turned into something that's really in a way quite beautiful there are a couple of these this is another of that same um, drowning victim okay and then uh, I've got another one here, meningitis, I think. Yeah, fatal meningitis 2 from the morgue series. Here again, um, you know, if you didn't know the title, you wouldn't know. You would assume this was a sleeping child. Uh, this also, by the way, taps into a hugely long tradition in photography of postmortem photography of children, especially in America, especially in the 19th century when um, child mortality was really quite high uh, after photography was introduced as a as a technology more and more families if they suffered the tragic loss of a child would actually have a photographer take a photograph of that of the baby or child sometimes a family photograph or the mom holding the baby or child um, as a commemoration before they buried the baby or the child so um, he's tapping into a long tradition here a long uh, photographic tradition as well but again for the uninitiated public, right, who are just taxpayers and don't particularly know or care about contemporary art, they may not see such a thing in that context. And that is where I think the root of the trouble was for Serrano in uh, the 1980s. And it was at the center of this debate, this NEA debate, the debate about whether or not the government should be um, charged with funding 
um, artists? And if so, who should choose which artists get the funding? That was at the heart of the issue. Do art experts get to choose or should the lay public get to choose? If art experts choose, are they going to choose stuff like this that offends the regular taxpayer? If lay people choose, are they going to choose stuff that wouldn't be of high enough quality for the opinion of art experts? So that in, you know, that's a kind of part of an, I think, an ongoing question or problem or tension in art now, which is that it has become a specialized community. It has become a somewhat insulated community that is largely showing in either galleries in New York or galleries on the West Coast or galleries in Beijing and London and um, other of the major contemporary art centers. And does it get too removed from people for regular folks to get this stuff? You know, that's a, an ongoing kind of problem or question. The other artist who, one of the other artists who becomes a flashpoint in the late 80s for this government funding controversy is the photographer Robert Maplethorpe, who actually died um, just as a controversy was brewing around a retrospective of his work in 1989, the show that was being organized that was to, to gather together some of his most important work is called The Perfect Moment. And he literally died about two months before the show was set to open. Um, so the perfect moment, and he died of AIDS, by the way. So, um, I mean, AIDS was a, a major issue for the art community in the 1980s. And, and uh, so, unfortunately, Maplethorpe died um, right at this time. He also, I mean, if you read the Queer Theory article and read the thing about Andy Warhol, you are familiar with this a little bit. Robert Maplethorpe is also kind of a byproduct of this identity politics that we saw in the 60s and 70s. And um, we've talked in lecture about feminism and um, African Americans, but also um, there's a kind of gay liberation movement that starts with the um, Stonewall Rebellion in 1969 and goes out from there. So um, moving uh, homosexuality from the illegal and from the underground to a part of um, a, a, a part of life, you know, um, decriminalizing homosexual activity was one of the one of the goals of the gay liberation movement. And once that had been somewhat accomplished, um, there was a sort of press for um, more general acceptance, you know, eroding homophobia and things like that. Well, Maplethorpe comes along kind of at the height of this transition period where there's also a lot of blowback and resistance to the idea of, um, say, gay rights and things like that. Partly, I'm sorry to say, because of the appearance of AIDS and its early association with the gay community and this idea that, um, you know, somehow it was um, a, a consequence of being gay and things like that. In fact, at some point in the 80s, there were, um, you know, discussions of, I mean, uh, well, it just... I don't know. It's hard to. It's hard, probably, for young people to to go back to a point in time when things were like this. But you know, when um, Rock Hudson, who was a very kind of iconic movie star of the 1950s, when it was discovered that Rock Hudson had AIDS and that Rock Hudson was actually gay, it was it sent huge shockwaves through um, pop culture because people just couldn't believe it. You know, people were so closeted back then. But anyway. Robert Maplethorpe is on the cusp of this, and some of the photographs that he did were, um, especially this series called The Export Folio, were portraits of and pictures of friends of his and lovers of his from the gay community. Some of them were um, rather sexually explicit, as a few of the pieces I'm going to show you are. So again, fair warning, there are a couple of rather explicit images coming up. The export folio, in particular, became one of the flashpoints for controversy. This show, The Perfect Moment, had been partly underwritten by the NEA, and it was going into galleries that got other funding from the NEA. And in fact, right before the show opened, this other controversy had broken over Andres Serrano, and the director of the Corcoran Gallery, which is a modern or contemporary art gallery in Washington, D.C., fairly close to the Capitol building, um, the director of the Corcoran Gallery 
decided that it would be better, she decided it would be better to cancel the show than to gather the attention of Jesse Helms and Congress because the Corcoran runs on government money and uh, she did not want to lose all of her funding um, just for the sake of putting on this one show. Uh, and so, uh, and then later when the perfect moment the next year traveled to a gallery in Cincinnati or a, a museum in Cincinnati, the town of Cincinnati actually put the um, museum director and the curator of the show on trial for on obscenity charges. So uh, this became a kind of flashpoint again for this question of not only government funding, but then what's the line between art and pornography. This is an example of one of the kinds of photographs that Robert Maplethorpe became famous for. He did a whole series, both in black and white and in color, he did these beautiful, luscious close-ups of flowers. And that was one of the series, uh, one of the kinds of photography for which Maplethorpe was known. He also did lots and lots of portraits of people who were celebrities or important in society or, you know, the kind of glitterati of New York City. And those were two of his um, M.O.s, two of his ways of photographing, or two of his subject areas. Uh, another subject area for him, however, was, again, um, his realm, his friends, his circle of... Um, his circle of acquaintances and lovers who were part of the gay community in New York at the time. And his series of photographs of those men and those men engaged in certain activities were, an, that was another realm in which he photographed. So for example, here is a photograph from his ex-portfolio, which has um, two men engaged in a kind of um, anal sex, all right? Uh, as you can see, this is a pretty um, abstract composition, right? It's framed in close up enough or close up enough that at first when you're looking at it, you can't see you don't necessarily see what's really going on. It is a really dense interplay of um, tones and uh, gradients and a range of colors from white to black. However, of course, it is also a very explicit photograph of a particular sexual activity that is not considered, that is typically considered, I would not, I don't know if I should say deviant or, um, but just not the norm, okay? Uh, and so this is part of the series of images, and what you're seeing on your screen is really fairly small. Remember, these are usually a couple feet wide, a couple feet tall, really large images that would fill your um, range of vision. So... It is this kind of imagery that gets the Maplethorpe show into some trouble. In Cincinnati, when the um, director of the gallery of the museum and the curator were put on trial, there were outside experts who were called to testify. Why is this picture art? Why is this not considered, you know, porn? And um, the defense that was offered was to say that you know there are there are similar. Um, formal concerns going on with the kind of flower pictures that he took and these um, more explicit sexual ex-portfolio pictures that Maplethorpe took. There is a balance of tones. There is an attention to composition. Um, and if you can see, look at the photograph on the left and the photograph on the right, you know, there's the same kind of style, a centrally um, organized composition with the whole range from deep, deep black to very, very white highlights, um, that this is a formal composition and that it is not the kind of thing that you would see if you were just picking up some porno magazine from the adult bookstore does not concern itself with um, lighting and composition and abstraction and range of tone and things like that. So that is what separates art and, and pornography. And um, actually, in the Cincinnati case, the director and the um, curator were acquitted of um, obscenity charges. However, this is, again, the kind of thing that is a constant concern and is uh, one of the things that's getting critical and political attention in the 80s. And I think you can see why. I mean, I suppose that people who were not part of the art world or not interested in the formal concerns would just kind of you know, not get it or dismiss it out of hand and say, well, you know, but it is a picture of what it is, right? 
This photograph from the X portfolio, which is a, a portrait of one of Maplethorpe's lovers, um, is titled Man in Polyester Suit. This one actually made it into Senator Jesse Helms' little folder. Um, Jesse Helms had selected pictures of Maplethorpe and Serrano's that he took with him, and when he wanted to talk about what it is he found so offensive or what it is he found so um, outrageous about the claim that these photographers were making art, this is one of the photographs that he would pull out, okay? Oh, here, by the way, is one of uh, Maplethorpe's sort of society portraits. So here's a picture of um, Andy Warhol. This is from about the year before Warhol died um, from complications of gallbladder surgery. Warhol, by this point, is the elder statesman of the New York art world and is, you know, a major celebrity, major player. And so this is the kind of, the other kind of subject matter that Maplethorpe was known for. Maplethorpe has come under some criticism for, oops, sorry, I'm going to go back here for a second. He's come under some criticism for, um, you know, here's a, a white society guy, and this is the portrait that he makes of Andy Warhol, but then, you know, think back to his friend man in a polyester suit when he has a black friend, the guy, I mean, it's sort of, you know, let's take the stereotype and make it real, right? And then, you know, the, the guy doesn't even get his face photographed, just his, um, just his genitalia. And so um, he's been criticized posthumously for, um, for his kind of, you know, racial connotations of some of his photographs. But that was certainly not a concern of Jesse Helms at that time. I mean, his concern was, here you've got this, you know, pornographic photography. Why should this be shown in government-sponsored museums, and why should taxpayers pay for this? Uh, and also, the two photographs that, besides the man in a polyester suit that Helms carried with him, and that actually ended up changing the law, um, are, are this photograph, Jesse from 1976, and Rosie from 1976. These are two photographs of children, as you can see, and I'm going to go back here for just a second, two photographs of children that are um, in the nude or partially nude. And this, by the way, these photographs, Jesse and, and Rosie, were both taken when the parents of these children were present and with the parents' consent. And then the photographs were um, allowed, I mean, the Maplethorpe Estate was allowed to display those photographs with the permission of the parents of the children involved. However, when these came to Cincinnati, and particularly, this inspired part of the major protest over this show, uh, particularly this photograph, Rosie, which was another one that Helms carried with him in his little portfolio. And here I'm showing you on the left a photograph from the from the time, um, from from the um, protests over the Perfect Moment show coming to Cincinnati. And as you can see, they are labeling this child porn basically all right now this is one of those photographs where i think all of these questions come into play uh going back to marcel duchamp when you look at this photograph if you see a dirty picture is that because the picture is a dirty picture or is it because you have a dirty mind right that's a central question that's going on here um what ended up happening in this case is this ended up um, inspiring the passage of a law about child pornography saying um, that that was restricting the sale distribution of um, any photographs of children in which genitalia are exposed okay so but and you know it generate it just continues to generate questions. I mean, is this acceptable? Yes, it's true. Her parents said it was okay, but does that mean that her parents were abusive? Um, it, you know, interestingly, in the case of Rosie, she's an adult now, and she runs, the last time I um, heard of her, or last time I was doing research on this, she was running a coffee shop in London, and she had this photograph framed on the wall. So she did not, as an adult, have any problem with this photograph. Um... So I, I don't have the answers to these questions about, you know, is this art or child porn? Is it a dirty picture? I mean, I think these are questions that are open questions and that are the kind of thing that this, um, this photograph and this kind of artwork continues to provoke these questions and these problems um, even today. So I don't have the answer to this. I did want you to be aware of some of what the images were that were the subject of the controversy that you've been reading about this week. Oh, and by the way, I should mention, this is the 
cover of the catalog of the perfect moment. And one of the things I personally find a little interesting about this whole controversy is when the Corcoran um, decided not to show the, the perfect moment, protesters actually organized uh, an event where they projected the ex-portfolio photographs onto the exterior of the Corcoran gallery at night. Um, so that, you know, they were being shown on the Corcoran, if not in the Corcoran. Uh, however, when you see the catalog to the show and then flyers that were distributed to try to help, to try to encourage people to write to their congressmen to protest against the protest, to say we need to fund shows like this, it was flower images that people chose, that the catalog designer chose, and that um, the posters that were distributed to try to encourage, to get people behind the show and to get people to write to their congressmen and say, don't censor the perfect moment. It's this kind of image that you see. You don't see man in a polyester suit. You don't see the, um, the other untitled image from the export portfolio that I was showing you, uh, which is kind of an interesting, you know, it's just kind of something to think about. Why didn't they show the export portfolio photographs on the cover of the catalog? Uh, and, and in fact, you know, more recently, I think in 1998, another show of Robert Maplethorpe that was in London that had a, or actually, sorry, somewhere else in England, had a um, catalog that went with it, and the you, the press that published the catalog was ta hauled into court in London, in England um, over questions of whether or not they were distributing child pornography. So I don't think that this is an issue that ever goes away or ever gets resolved, even when court cases are heard and decided. It continues to be an issue that um, it continues to challenge people. So uh, it's something to think about, you know, and something to be aware of. It's something that crops up time and again in the history of contemporary art. And that is all that I have for this week. Make sure that you do the readings for this week, and I'll see you next week for the Young British Artists.